If you think the weather in the UK can be changeable, how about a 57 degree temperature difference in just 24 hours? That's what happened in Loma, Montana in January 1972. The temperature went from minus 48 at 9 a.m. to plus 9 Celsius by 8 a.m. the following morning, earning it a Guinness World Record for the greatest temperature range in a day. So what caused this dramatic temperature shift? Well, it wasn't the sun, as this happened in the winter, where days are short and the sun's low in the sky. Instead, the culprit was a phenomenon known as the Thern Effect. This term was originally used to refer to the southerly wind that sweeps across the northern side of the Alps during winter, bringing thawing conditions. And it's a German word. You might have seen it spelt either F-O-E-H-N or F-O-H-N, with an umlaut over the O. The word fern actually translates to hairdryer. It's a fitting name and is now a widely recognised term for this kind of strong, warm and dry downslope wind, regardless of the specific mountain range or region. While the name originated in the Alps, the phenomenon itself occurs in various mountainous areas around the world, often with different local names. In North America's Rocky Mountains, it is known as the Chinook, or Snow Eater Wind. Over in Libya, they call it the Ghibli Wind, and in the Andes of Argentina, it's known as the Zonda. And even in the UK, we experience it through the Helm Wind over the Northern Pennines, and it is known for setting winter temperature records in parts of eastern Scotland. Typically, Scotland is expected to be the coldest place in Britain, but on 29th of January 2024, Kinlochy, a village in the Northwest Highlands, set a record for the hottest day in January in the UK by recording a temperature of 19.6 Celsius, 13 degrees above the average high temperature for the area, all due to the fern effect. So we know what it's called, but how does it form? Now brace yourself, things are going to get a bit scientific. Many explanations for the fern effect typically stop at just one mechanism, notably the formation of condensation and precipitation over mountain tops. But in reality, there are four mechanisms which work together to shape this weather phenomenon. The influence of them varies depending on the shape and scale of the mountain regions and also the weather setup looking at temperature, humidity and wind speed. So let's dive into this atmospheric puzzle and find out more about how these mechanisms combine to transform cool moist air into warm dry winds which sweep down mountains with surprising intensity. For a fern wind to form by any mechanism we need two things. Firstly, the atmosphere needs to be stable, and secondly, we want moist air on the windward side of the mountain. Let's start off with the mechanism that many explanations use as the sole cause of the fern effect, and that is condensation and precipitation. Here is a side view of a 4,000 foot high mountain range, which is approximately the height of Ben Nevis, the highest peak in the UK. Air on the windward side is moist, with a temperature of 12 degrees and a dew point of 9 degrees. We've mentioned about dew point in some of our other videos, but to recap, it's the temperature at which air becomes saturated, meaning it can't hold any more moisture. When air cools to this point, excess water vapour turns into liquid, forming dew, fog or clouds. As the moist air rises up the windward side of the mountain, it cools. The rate of change of temperature with height as air rises is determined by something called the adiabatic lapse rate. Generally, all air contains some amount of water vapour, but until it becomes saturated, it follows the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is a warming or cooling of approximately 3 degrees per thousand feet. So, our air with a temperature of 12 degrees at the base of the mountain cools to 9 degrees at a height of a thousand feet. This is the same temperature as the dew point, so now the air is saturated. This means it can no longer hold the water vapour and the moisture condenses out to form clouds and precipitates as rain or snow on the mountain's windward slopes. When the water vapour in the air turns into liquid, like when clouds form, it actually releases heat which acts to slow the cooling process. This means that air that becomes saturated follows a lesser cooling rate of roughly 1.5 degrees per thousand feet, which is known as the saturated adiabatic lapse rate. Following this rate to the top of the mountain and the air now has a temperature of 4.5 degrees. Going down the leeward side, the stable air sinks. If no precipitation had occurred over the mountain peak, the air would retain its moisture content and would return to the same temperature and humidity that it started with on the windward side. 
This is called a reversible process. However, in this case, the air has lost a significant amount of its water content through precipitation, so it's undergone an irreversible process. This means it will not be able to go back to its starting state. As the air begins to descend the mountain, it is now much drier than it was before and quickly becomes unsaturated. Let's say the air has lost enough moisture through precipitation over the mountain to become unsaturated as it descends past 3,000 feet up. It now warms up at a higher rate of the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which, remember, is 3 degrees per 1,000 feet, resulting in an air temperature of 15 degrees and a lower dew point of approximately 6 degrees at the foot of the mountain on the leeward side. Comparing the starting and end conditions, you can see that the air is now warmer and drier than it was when it started to rise up the mountain. So that wraps up our first mechanism, and it is a pretty big one, which is why it often steals the spotlight in many explanations. But if a fern effect happens and the air hasn't lost moisture through precipitation, then this is likely to have been caused by another process, which takes me on to the second mechanism, the drawdown of air from a loft. This happens when the wind just isn't strong enough to push low level air up and over a mountain. So instead the air gets blocked like a traffic jam at the base of the slope. Instead, it's only the air from higher up near the mountain peaks that manages to flow over and descend the other side. As that high altitude air descends, it gets squeezed by the rising pressure near the surface. That compression heats up the air and dries it out, giving us those warm, dry fern winds that sweep down the leeward slopes. The third mechanism at play is turbulent mixing, a dynamic process you've likely witnessed in rivers, with water rushing over rocks, churning into frothy rapids and white water. That's turbulence in action, blending water and air. Now imagine the atmosphere doing something similar. As air flows over the mountains, it becomes turbulent, stirring the atmosphere vertically. Remember I mentioned we have stable air with the warmer air sitting on top of cooler air? So this vertical mixing of the cross mountain airflow lifts moisture upwards and pulls warmer, drier air downwards. The fourth and final mechanism is to do with radiative warming. Dry fern winds are the driving force behind the creation of rain shadows, which are those clear, sunny zones tucked away on the leeward side of mountains. With clouds swept away due to the dry air and skies wide open, these areas soak up more sunshine, leading to stronger daytime heating. This type of warming is particularly important in cold regions where snow or ice melt is a concern and avalanches are a risk. This brings me on to the impacts of the fern effect. While areas under its influence enjoy warmer, drier climates and a longer crop growing season than they otherwise would, it's the fern's more destructive side that often grabs the headlines. This sudden surge of warmth can unleash avalanches in ski resorts, speed up glacial melt, and even trigger downstream flooding. In polar regions, it's also been linked to the breakup of ice shelves, with the Larsen Ice Shelf in Antarctica being a notable example of this. Fern winds can roar down mountain slopes at speeds of 60 to 90 miles per hour, with gusts reaching over a staggering 120 miles per hour. This strength is driven by pressure differences between the windward and leeward sides of a mountain. This gradient accelerates the air downslope, increasing wind speed dramatically. Local topography can increase speeds further through acceleration over rounded summits and funneling through the valleys and gorges in the area. These fierce windstorms frequently damage property and infrastructure and pose a serious threat to climbers, especially on notorious routes such as the north face of the Eiger in the Alps. But perhaps most dangerously, the fern's cocktail of warmth, dryness and high speed gusts creates a perfect storm for wildfires. By lowering humidity and drying out vegetation, these winds can exacerbate fire conditions. A spark can turn into a fast-moving inferno, racing across the landscape with devastating speed. This is what happened in Los Angeles in January 2025. Santa Ana winds are a fern-like wind which bring the same warm and dry conditions. In some places, these winds reach around 100 miles per hour, which was a major factor in the spread of the fire, which burnt through 57,000 acres and destroyed 18,000 homes and structures. Finally, a fascinating and somewhat mysterious phenomenon tied to the fern effect is something known as fern crankite, which literally means fern sickness. Symptoms range from headaches and migraines 
to sleep disturbances and restlessness. This may sound rather strange, but a study done by the University of Calgary found correlations between the fern-like Chinook wind and increased migraine occurrences, and is one of the most cited pieces of evidence supporting the idea that rapid weather changes, like those caused by Chinook or fern winds, can influence neurological health. So there we have it. The fern effect is more than just a mountain breeze, it's a powerful atmospheric process with far-reaching impacts on weather, landscapes, and even human health. Thank you for watching.